how many how many of you have siblings brothers sisters a lot of us so you probably will understand this better than better than most but my uh i have siblings I have two brothers two sisters and uh my uh brother closest to age to me you know we were uh, we were the ones who were, we were always running around together, you know, doing things together, especially as we got a little bit older, you know, hanging out together and that kind of thing uh, for the most part. But um, I was, I'm the firstborn in my family, and so uh, for whatever reason, I've just been, uh, as the firstborn, you know, try to be responsible, try to be, you know, try to be the good kid, right? Like, try to do the right thing most of the time, uh, you know, just didn't get in trouble a whole lot as a kid. Uh, that kind of deal, and so as I got a little bit older, my brother in closest to age to me, uh, he was not that. Uh, he was the complete opposite of that, if anything, and so he was the one who was always in trouble, always like, if anything happened, if anything, you know, there was something that that you know, went weird or uh, awry or whatever, and you know, s- something was wrong, it was his fault all the time, right? Like, at least that's what my parents thought. They always thought, well, it had to be him. It had to be his fault. He's the one who probably did this, that kind of thing. I remember on uh, multiple occasions where that was the case, is where, uh, you know, maybe something got broke at the house or, you know, something didn't get done. You know, it's something that my, our parents asked us not to do or to do or whatever, and it didn't happen or, you know, whatever. And so it would always be the first person that they would look to as the culprit would be my brother, right? They would never look at me. They would never, they never thought that it had anything to do with me. It was always him. And I can think of many times where that was not the case. It actually was me, right? It, it was me, but he was the one getting in trouble, and I'm over here going, ha, you know, like getting away with it now. And then there, there were times when that might have been the case where I was actually with him and part of it, and we both kind of did it, but yet th- there again, they were getting on to him, and I'm thinking at least to myself, I've gotten away with it. I'm not in trouble this time. I'm not, like, he's the one who's getting it. He deserves it. He's probably done stuff that hasn't been caught yet, so he needs more, right? Like, pour it on. And then my parents look at me and go, but you're not off the hook, (laughs) right? Oh, you're in trouble too, you know? You ever had those moments, brothers, sisters, where you, you sit there and you think, oh, you know, my brother, my sister, they're, they're the ones getting in trouble. They, you know, they, they, they didn't even get caught for this or that, and so this, this is just, they're just deserving of all of it. And I'm scot-free because I've been pretty good, even though I did that, but I've been pretty good, right? Well, that's kind of how Romans chapter 2 starts and how Romans chapter 2 uh, begins. And that's where we're going to start together this morning is in Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1 together. Uh, We've been walking through the book of Romans together, and we finally, after 10 weeks now, made it to Romans chapter 2. So, uh, I don't, you know, we're we're going, right? We're moving along a little bit. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, as he is writing this letter, he's writing this letter to Christians, believers in Rome, um, but these Christians in Rome, they're not just Jewish Christians, they're not just Gentile Christians, they're they're Greek and they're Jewish and they're uh, they're all over the place. Gentile and Jewish and just a big mix of of everyone because it is in Rome. And so at different times throughout the letter of Romans, he will address different groups of people different ways. Just like he does here at the end of Romans chapter 1, which is where we were at last week, specifically in verses 29 through 32. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then he kind of, as he goes through, like in 29 through 32 of, of Romans chapter 1, he sort of lists out like this long list of, of sins, right, that he talks about. And he says, the unrighteous, they're, they're filled with evil and envy and murder, quarrels, deceit, malice, like all of these things. We talked about those last week. And so you get to the end of that, And if you are a Jewish Christian and you're listening to this letter being read, as those last paragraph or so of the first chapter of Romans is being read, 
the Jewish Christians are probably thinking to themselves, ha, pour it on them, get them. They deserve it. Look at them, greedy people, full of malice and envy and murder and deceit and all unrighteousness. That's right. And then Paul goes, oh, but wait, you're not off the hook either. And then he turns to them to talk to them about judgment and hypocrisy and then repentance. And so chapter 1 of Romans ends with Paul showing how people reject God and how God gives them over to wickedness and godlessness. And then he, he moves into this, this next part here talking about judgment and hypocrisy and ultimately repentance. So as the last part of the first few paragraphs of this letter are being read again, you can almost imagine the, the other Jewish believers or, or, or these other believers just thinking to themselves, that's right, pour it on them, pour it on them. I'm glad, you know, maybe they're even thinking, I'm, I'm glad I'm not one of those dirty, rotten Gentile sinners. Or thinking that they were maybe somehow exempt from condemnation because they were God's chosen people. They were law-keeping Jews. And I think most religious people would hear sort of the last part of Romans chapter 1 maybe the same way, right? That's right, God's wrath is for the immoral, those that pursue wickedness and evil. That's what God's wrath is for. The whole while missing the point. So let's look at this together. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1, just five verses together this morning. If you didn't bring a Bible, the scripture will be on the screen, or you can follow along in your YouVersion Bible app. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1, Paul says this. So at the end of chapter 1, he says, in 32, he says, Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die or deserve God's wrath, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. And so the, he says, so therefore, again, referring back to what he just said, he says, so therefore, because of this, he says, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think anyone of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same thing that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. And so Paul begins here sort of with a, a warning of sorts. And in fact, there's, there's two warnings in here in these first couple of verses. But he begins with this, this warning. And again, in uh, verses 29 through 32 of chapter 1, he lists out these 21 uh, different sins that show ungodly thought and behavior. And so in chapter 1, what Paul is doing is he's really addressing the, the ungodly and, and the unrighteous. And then here in chapter 2, Paul was likely addressing any religious person who would look down at sinners and non-believers. The way they saw it is that the ungodly and wicked would be judged and they would be the ones who would get a pass. And so Paul basically says, no, 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 not so fast. You are guilty of the same things. And I'm sure we all know people who do that, right? See what I just did there? Some of you got that. But we look at this list, right? If you go to back to chapter 1, we look at this list in uh, 29 through 32, and we think, man, I've never, I've never murdered anyone. I don't think I'm full of malice or deceit. I mean, I've never slandered anybody, right? I'm, I, I'm not an inventor of evil. I don't come up with new ways to be wicked or evil or sinful. I'm always good to my parents. 
I'm trustworthy, I'm loving, I'm merciful. Like, none of this applies to me. I'm good. I've made it. But, now, Terry, what works down the hall down here? <laughs> All of them, right? See, the problem is, is that we may read this list in a self-righteous kind of way. Like, if you read that list, and as we, if you were here last week and we're going through this list, and you're going through this, and you're going, nope, not me, not me, not me, not me, not, ah, sometimes, just a little bit, not that bad, though. That is, that is looking at it through the lens of self-righteousness, which is exactly what Paul is talking about. And so the other thing that you have to understand is that Paul isn't just talking about the actions of someone, but also the inward thoughts of someone, because isn't, isn't that what Jesus points out in the Sermon on the Mount? If you, you go and look at it yourself, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you can read the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, but Jesus would say this, he would say, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill, but I say to you, so Jesus is like, the, the commandment says, you shall not kill, and then, and then he goes, but I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? Or then he says this, he says, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at another lustfully has committed adultery with them in their heart. Well, that changes things again. And so you think, though, but, but how is that the same? Like, thinking something versus acting on something, like, how are those things the same? And what he's saying is he's saying that these thoughts are like seeds. They're the beginnings to what leads to the outward actions. It has to start somewhere, right? And so where does it start? It starts in the heart. And the only difference, like, the only difference between me and like, this is a scary thought. You think about this. The only difference between me and a murderer is water on that seed. It's water on the seed. What causes one to murder begins in the heart. And so the warning, the warning that Paul is giving is about passing judgment. That's one part of it, but it's also the hypocrisy around it. To look at someone and go, well, I'm not like, I'm not like that. I'm not like them. I'm better off than they are. I've never done this. I've never thought that. It's only those kinds of people. And I'm not those kinds of people. I'm better. I mean, I go to church. I'm from America. I'm Christian. I live in a Christian nation. You don't, by the way. See, we can't pass judgment on to others because we are guilty of the same things. And he says the wicked, or that we are guilty of the same things that even the wicked are guilty of. How many of you know that there is a difference between being someone who can simply call out right and wrong, following God's view of morality, and then being someone who passes judgment? Right? There's a difference between those two things, right? You understand that, that if you look at something and you say, well, that, that is uh, according to the ways of God, the commands of God, and obedience to God, that is wrong, right? We can look at something and, and we can say that, we can call out something that is wrong, but then there's a difference between being able to do that and then just passing on judgment on that, right? Just being judgy of someone, that's America's new favorite pastime, by the way, judgment. Used to be baseball, now it's just being judgy. <laughs> we've, we've entered into this new age, I think, where we all have little gavels called social media where we get to be our own little judges. And the problem is, is we're not called to be judges unless you have a law degree. But... Somehow, we think when we get to heaven that maybe we'll get to sit on Jesus' lap and help him judge the world. He doesn't need any help. I think he's got it. Jesus is the judge, and he judges by truth. Right? This is what Paul says here, is that, that he judges by truth. He doesn't judge by emotion. He ju doesn't judge by feeling. 
He judges by truth. Passing judgment is not simply saying that is wrong. It's it is saying that is wrong, but it's it's saying that is wrong with the side of attitude, right? It's saying that's wrong, and I'm glad I'm not that way, or I don't do that. It's Luke 18, right, where uh, the sinner and the the Pharisee are are in the same temple and they're praying together, and the Pharisee looks at at, at the sinner and goes, "I'm I'm glad I'm not like him. <laughs> at least I'm not like that." It's viewing others as deserving of God's judgment, but viewing yourself as exempt. Have you ever caught yourself saying, um, you know, I I know I did that. I know I said this. I know I did, you know, I know I, I, I know that this was not exactly right. Like we use that term. This was not exactly. We don't say that was wrong. We say, I know that that was not exactly right, but at least I didn't do that. Right. We're just making it. We're just trying to make ourselves feel better while looking upon someone else and going, they are way worse than I am. What they did was worse than what I did. But you still gossiped about someone. Doesn't matter. The the way that they did it was way worse. That's judgment. Right. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about John Stott wrote this he said we work ourselves up into a state of self-righteous indignation over the disgraceful behavior of other people while the very same behavior seems not nearly not so serious when it's ours rather than theirs and Paul says when you do this you're condemning yourself your own your own testimony has deemed you guilty look at what he says in verse 2 he says we know That God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. And then verse 3, he says, Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same thing that you will escape God's judgment? And so here's the scary truth. The same judgment we use to judge others will be used to judge us when we stand before the holy God of justice. Paul says, when you judge another, you condemn yourself. It's like we are the undercover informants against our own hearts. Um, You ever told on yourself? You know what I'm talking about? Um, (laughs) So uh, it's been a couple years back, but I needed to to renew my tags on my truck. And... um, I know all of you in the first service here are good people, and you renew your tags before they expire. Um, you do that. You take care of it. You don't drive your vehicle at, you know, a day after the tags expire. Uh, some of you do for like three years, but that's mostly in the second service. That's not any of you here in the, in the 9 o'clock service. Um, my tags were, we'll, say, we'll just call them a little bit expired. Um, we'll just say, see, see how I did that? Um, not full, just a little bit. Um, so I pull in and, uh, you can, you know, you just go through a drive through uh, here in Anderson County and you just go through a drive through and you can renew your tags. Right. And so I, I pull in and I'm sitting there and I let the lady know, like, I give her my registration. I'm like, Hey, I need to renew these tags. And, you know, she takes it and I'm thinking to myself, she's not going to say anything. She's just going to, you know, I'm going to pay for it. She's going to give it to me. We're going to go about our way. And she's kind of doing the thing. Then she looks at it for a minute, and, I get, and, and then she looks at me, and she looks at it, and she looks at my truck, and she looks at it, and she looks at my truck, and she goes, have you been driving this vehicle? I'm sitting in it right now. You know? I'm, I'm like, I'm actually sitting in it, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I can get out of this one. Like, I think I just told on myself, you know? <laughs> and I go, uh... Define a lot, you know. <laughs> Have you been driving this vehicle? Well, I'm driving it right now, so yes, I, I guess so, you know. And so uh, she just kind of looks at me and she goes, you know, and she stamps the thing, gives it to me, and, I, you know, I pay for it. But I told her myself, right? Um, and we do that. Like, this is, this is what Paul is talking about. He's, he's saying that our, our own hearts, the way that we judge, the way that, the, the way that we do that, it, it, it's condemning ourselves. We're just 
constantly telling on ourselves. And some people, maybe, maybe even some of us in this room, will we'll stand before God one day and say, we'll say something like, well, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, that's true, but it, it wasn't like this, or it wasn't like that, and it wasn't this bad, and it wasn't, you know. Or we might even say, you know what, hey, I, didn't even, I wasn't even sure that you really existed. I didn't have enough proof. But here's the thing. You see, he won't judge you according to the Bible necessarily or judge you according even to Christ. He will judge you based on your own heart, your own level of judgment. You will be judged by the standards to which you judge others is what Paul is saying. And so none of us will be able to stand according to our own judgments. We'll be condemned simply based upon that. And that is what Paul is getting at. Listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 7, um, starting in verse 1. Again, from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. He says, do not judge. Uh-oh. He says, do not judge so that you won't be judged. He says, don't judge so that you won't be judged. And he's not necessarily talking about in an earthly way. He says, for you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others. I don't know if it gets any more clearer than that. And you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye and look, there's a beam of wood in your own hypocrite Jesus using some strong language says hypocrite first take out the beam of wood out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye look at verse 3 back to Romans chapter 2 verse 3 Paul asks this question he says do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same thing he says, he asks the question, he says, do you think that you will escape God's judgment? Let me just answer the question for us. No. No, we will not. God's judgment has no exceptions. God's judgment is the same for us all. Whether you think one way or another, maybe because you think, well, I vote for the right party, not the wrong party. I'm going to stand on the right side of history, so I'll be judged differently according to that. I mean, I'm American, so that makes me something, right? Or anything else. God's judgment is not based upon any of that. God's judgment is based upon truth. His righteous truth. And that's it. If we somehow think we are the exception, then it makes it dangerous for us to think that we don't need repentance or that maybe we won't even ultimately turn to Jesus. Look at verse 4. We'll continue on. He says, or, so he asks the question, he says, do you think you'll escape God's judgment or do you despise the riches of his kindness? That word kindness, uh, your translation may say goodness. Kindness and goodness, they're sort of interchangeable here, but his kindness, his goodness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness or God's goodness is intended to lead you to repentance. And so in verse 4, he reminds them of how good God has been to them. He's like, hey, do, do, you, do you not see God's kindness and his goodness and how good and kind and patient he has been with you? And all of that patience, all of that goodness, every bit of that, it's there. It's not there because he thinks that you're special in some kind of way. It's there because he wants you to turn to him. He wants you to repent. That's what repentance means. It means to turn away from. It means to change direction. He says that God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance. And he's just reminding them of how God has been good to them. And for those listening, many of those listening to this letter being read, it was a reminder to them 
of specifically how good is God, that God has been to them. All the things that God had given them and done for them and shown them and brought them out of captivity and slavery, rescuing. And of course, the goodness of Jesus. But they missed the point of God's goodness to them because it was meant to bring the repentance as he patiently waited for them to obey. But what did, what did the Israel people continue to do? Disobey. Move in a, a different direction. With hardened hearts. And so have you, ever, have you ever considered and thought about God's goodness in your life? You ever thought about how God's goodness and kindness to you in your life, again, is not because you're some kind of special, not because you somehow, some way, achieved a certain level of earning God's kindness towards you. Right? We 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 live in a we live in a a a society and a culture where where we do things sometimes for people because we want them to be nice to us. Right? We want them to, to return the favor somehow. But it doesn't work that way with God. He loves us because he chooses to love us, not because we've done something to earn it. And so therefore, he wants us to repent. His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, to lay our sin down before him. To look at the condition of our own hearts and go, is it me? Am I the problem? What do I need to lay down before the Lord? Or maybe you look at that and you go, repentance, repent of what? I mean, I'm the good one here. (laughs) And Paul would say, precisely. The riches of his kindness means that there is no depth, no bottom to the goodness of God. We are only here. You think about this. We are only here because of his kindness, because of his goodness. We only have breath in our lungs because of his kindness and his goodness. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter writes this. He says, The Lord does, does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's God's great desire, is for all to come to repentance, for you to come to repentance, that you specifically, not just me, but you specifically, have breath in your lungs because of his kindness and desire for us to be repentant people, to have repentant hearts. And then look at verse 5. Paul says, because of all of this, because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, here's the other warning is you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, the the return of Christ, the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. We are storing up wrath for ourselves by remaining unrepentant of our hypocritical, self-righteous, religious attitudes. And Paul's going to talk more about this in the coming verses. So again, Paul has compared two types of of people, the religious and and the unreligious, the self-righteous and the unrighteous. And yet, here's the incredible thing. What Paul is getting at here is he is saying this. He is saying that both need the gospel. Both need the gospel. It's not just one or the other. It's not just the this long list of wickedness, uh, slanderers, god haters, evil, disobedient spirits. Not just not just that group of people, but it's all, the gospel is for that group of people. But it is also for the people who look at that list and go, "I'm glad I'm not any of those things." And Paul's like, "But you actually kind of are 
You may not actually act them out, but it's in your heart. You need the gospel too. Both need the gospel. And again, maybe, maybe we think to ourselves, you know, that, that, that we're good, we do the right things and act the right certain way, and if we do that, it's just the, it, what Paul is saying is he, he's saying that's, if you do that, it's, it's just the same as doing none of these things. The religious think that they have a righteousness of their own doing, and so the religious and the non-religious both need a righteousness that is not their own. And Paul is just, he's just hammering that point over and over and over and over again. And will continue to do so all through the letter. But, let me close with this. How do, how do we know if we are the you that Paul is talking about? How do we know if we're one of these that Paul is talking about? One commentator asks these three questions. Three questions for us to consider as we close this morning. The first question is this. Is do you feel you are a hopeless sinner whom God would have every right to cast off this minute because of the state of your life and your heart? Or number two, when you consider... How those outside of, say, uh, this church live, do you shake your head in judgment and judge in your heart? In other words, do, do you look at people when you leave here in just a little bit and you, you're out at lunch or Costco or wherever it is that you're going to go later this afternoon, whatever it is that you're doing, you look at people and go... Look at those people. Can't believe they'd act like that. What do you consider? My heart is just like theirs. I just show it differently. It's a different way to look at it, isn't it? Or number three. Do you deep down believe that God will not judge you by the way that you have judged? Or have you accepted that your own values will condemn you and that you will need to be given a right standing that you could never achieve yourself? Humbly. So how would you, how would you answer those? Uh, just for me personally, as I've gone through these questions just over and over and over again this week, looking at them, I, I can see so much of myself in these at times. And then I'm reminded of the fact that God's kindness and goodness is there to lead me to repentance. So what do we do? We consider that, that we are... Maybe passing judgment on someone for their sin, but failing to recognize that we too are sinners and in need of the same amount of God's grace, just like everyone else. You see, I think when you and I recognize that the same grace and goodness of God that is needed for the most wicked, most hardened sinner is the same grace that you and I need, it changes the way you see the world around you. It changes the way that you see people. It changes the way that you see yourself. Right? If you consider the, um, just the most wicked person that you've ever met or seen in your entire life, and you consider that person and you look at your life and for a moment you go, well, I mean, I've done some things, but I ain't done those things. But the same amount of grace. And what is, what, what is that amount? It's everything. It's every ounce of grace that God gives. Every drop of blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Every moment of that is the same amount that is needed to save you. To bring you to repentance. 
bring me to salvation. It's no different. And so when we consider that and we see it that way, I think it changes the way that we see people around us. It changes the way that we see ourselves, or it should. I hope that it does. It has me. Will it you? That's the question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word this morning. Lord, sometimes the word is just hard, Lord, and it it convicts us and it it hits us right where we need it, Lord. And I sometimes I just feel like that what, where we open the word together each each week, Lord, to to look at sometimes that if anything else, it's just for me. And so, Father, I'm so grateful and thankful. God, that your kindness leads us to repentance. And so, Father, as we as we just sit and contemplate these things together this morning, Lord, would you show us? God, would you call out to us? God, let us be humble in our response. Let us be honest in our response. God, to, to lay ourselves before you. God, and to recognize that that maybe, that maybe we, we have judged others while being hypocrites ourselves. That there is repentance, there is grace, there is forgiveness for us. God, it doesn't give us a license to do so. But we are reminded, Lord, that of how much we need you, how much we need your grace even in times how imperfect that we are. So, Father, help us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond to the word together this morning and just giving us an opportunity to, to pray, to ask the Lord to even just search our own hearts, to call out anything uh, in, in our own hearts that, that we need to lay down before him. That, that maybe the, the words of Paul there is Paul sort of flips the page and, and reminds us and says, oh, hey, by the way, you think that none of those things are you, but it is you. You may not have necessarily acted them out in the same way, but maybe you thought them. Or maybe you desired to act them out in some way. And if that's us, then now is the time for us to, to do exactly what Paul is reminding them to do, is to repent. Again, repentance just simply means to change direction, to turn away from something and turn to something. And so we turn away from our sin and we turn to Jesus. We turn to the cross. And we're reminded of, of this fact that, that all of life is repentance. Is that there's not a moment like we... We repent when we are saved, and then we have no need for repentance any longer. That is, that is not true. That is not the gospel. That is not what the Scripture teaches. It teaches us that, that all of life is repentance, that, that we are in a state of repentance, of laying sin down before the Lord. So we get an opportunity to do that together this morning. And as we do that, after we do that, after we lay our hearts down before the Lord, we get an opportunity to celebrate His kindness and His goodness because we were reminded of that through communion. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ, again, every broken part of the body, every poured out drop of blood, no matter how good you think, you are or how unwicked you think you have been every drop and every broken piece was needed for you and for me and so we get to be reminded of that through communion as Jesus tells us hey every time you do this remember me so we invite you to come as Christ followers as believers as those who have taken time to lay down their sin before the Lord and receive communion together this morning so let's stand to our feet, let's worship.
Let's pray. Let's ask the, word, the, the Lord to work.